I would like to talk about uh, joint work that um, I've been doing with uh, collaborators from, uh, from Switzerland uh, on uh, using geometric deep learning for um, protein design. And uh, I guess I don't need nowadays to, to convince you that deep learning is interesting. So in some fields, it, it has uh, had a quite uh, revolutionary effect. Uh, if you take computer vision, for example, the, the, the way that this field uh, looks like nowadays compared to maybe just uh, a decade ago, it's completely different. Uh, we see that, that uh, in the past five or six years, roughly since 2012, uh, all the state-of-the-art methods are based on, um, on, on deep learning. And you can see here the performance on ImageNet. This is one of the, the classical benchmarks that is used in, in computer vision uh, image recognition task, starting from the uh, from the seminal work of Krzyzewski, this is, uh, this is the state of the art that yet nowadays it's probably not up to date uh, anymore, but this is better than human performance on, uh, on this task. There is some uh, controversial claims that actually what matters more, whether it's an algorithm or, or uh, a data set, and uh, this is from Wiesner Gross, uh, a little bit picky and a little bit uh, strange, I would say, but uh, if you look at the average time from introduction of an algorithm to the breakthrough, in uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence, however you define it, uh, versus uh, the introduction of the data set on which this uh, algorithm was trained, you can see that it's a huge difference, uh, respectively on, uh, around 18 years versus three years. Uh, of course, you can argue that that was not exactly the same algorithm. So for example, the, uh, the, the convolutional neural networks that were introduced in Jan Lecan's paper in 89 versus the architecture that was actually used uh, by, let's say, the same, the same group of Hinton in 2012 is not exactly the same, but at least roughly it's the same algorithm. Now, uh, deep learning is already quite successful. You can find it in commercial applications that uh, broadly range from, uh, let's say, computer vision applications in systems such as autonomous driving cars uh, to uh, uh, machine translation that are, is used by Google, for example, or Siri uh, that that, uh, that runs on your iPhone. So this is already a technology that that, that is used uh, on everyday basis. But if we look at the uh, most of the focus of research in in deep learning, it has been primarily on what we can call Euclidean structured data. So it's data that has underlying uh, grid structure, like images or acoustic signals. And uh, in many applications, in particular in biology, we are interested in data that doesn't have grid-like structure. So you can think of graphs as a prototypical example, and probably the most prominent example of graphs are social networks, right? You can model users as node of, uh, nodes of these graphs, and uh, social relations uh, can be modeled as edges. You can also describe different uh, systems of interactions or relations, such as biological interaction networks using graphs. You can describe molecules as graphs, as we'll see later. Uh, these, are, these are also... Um, uh, important representations in vision and graphics, well, slightly more structure. Usually, we are talking about uh, uh, about uh, meshed surfaces, so they have also some 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 extra structure. But bottom line, there is no grid whatsoever. It is unstructured, and uh, we need somehow to be able to apply deep learning methods to to this kind of data. So this is what we call geometric machine learning and uh, geometric deep learning in in particular. So this is a little bit of a kind of invented term. Uh, we popularized it in a review paper uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, also in uh, NIPS. At that time it was called NIPS, now it's called NeurIPS, uh, one of the mainstream machine learning conferences. We had a tutorial that was attended by a huge crowd. Again, relatively, the conference itself nowadays attracts about 10,000 people. And uh, there are many uh, interesting programs and special issues, and even a faculty position in genetic ML at the University of Amsterdam. So it is probably becoming more of a mainstream than exotic field. Now, you, you may ask why uh, geometric methods? Why do we want actually to incorporate geometric models into your, uh, uh, into your neural uh, architectures? Actually, geometric uh, ML works both ways. We try to, uh, to deploy uh, uh, deep learning uh, on geometric data and vice versa, we would like to, to build in some geometric priors, geometric knowledge into the, the neural network architectures. It's more or less the same way uh, why, uh, asking why convolutional neural networks, right? You can prove actually that even very shallow networks are universal approximators. You can take 
a neural network with one hidden layer, you can approximate any continuous function to any desired accuracy with these neural networks. Of course, it's a different question whether it, they work and they don't work when you deal with high dimensional data because of uh, a phenomenon that is called the curse of dimensionality. So uh, the success of deep learning, and in particular of, of CNNs, was abandoning uh, on purpose this uh, generality towards models where we incorporate some prior. So in case of convolutional neural networks, a very meaningful prior, uh, or inductive bias as you want uh, to call it, was uh, to assume that uh, for image recognition tasks, it doesn't matter where uh, the object is located in the image. If I, if let's say you want to classify to detect cats, it doesn't matter where exactly in the image this cat image is located. So that's why uh, the convolutional neural networks use shared weights, which reduces a lot the number of parameters and as a result, you're able to, to train very uh, deep and very complex networks while uh, avoiding the, the combinatorial explosion of the number of parameters. That's why these methods work in practice. You can generalize uh, uh, shift operators to some other group operators, such as rotations. So there is a nice line of work from the group of Max Welling doing it. Basically, we are trying to do it for non-Euclidean domains, for manifolds and graphs. There are many reasons why this is uh, why it's good to introduce problem-specific invariants. It allows to exploit the data in more principled way. It allows to train on way less data. If you know that there is some important invariance that, that, that you can include by construction and you know that it's meaningful in the, in the problem, uh, basically you avoid learning this kind of invariance from the data. It is already built into the architecture. And as a result, you have much lighter architectures. Uh, compared to the traditional ones. So let me show you one example of an application in computer graphics where these methods can be used. So this is uh, uh, markerless motion capture. So mark uh, motion capture is a technology that is used in movie production. Usually it's very expensive. Basically it's uh, uh, an array of 3D sensors that allows to capture uh, the uh, movement of uh, of, of the actor, of his face or, or, or the entire body. And in this case, uh, it is based on uh, just simple 3D sensor, so it costs about uh, $20. And uh, basically the way it works, you capture in real time a 3D scan of, uh, of a face. Then you have some canonical face model. So first problem that you need to solve is the problem of correspondence. You need to basically to find a map from the input data to this canonical uh, uh, face model. So you can call this model analysis. Then you need to, uh, to generate a new synthetic model of this canonical face in the pose of the, of the input image. So uh, we can call this model synthesis. And you can use geometric deep learning for both, uh, for both problems. So basically the main idea of what we are trying to do, we are trying to redefine the basic ingredients of convolutional neural networks, like the convolution, uh, the filtering operator itself. Uh, that is, it is defined on the surface itself. So here I will be working. Uh, I will be talking about primarily, primarily about surfaces, about meshes, but it can also be done on graphs. So maybe I will say a few words about about graphs. But this is what we are trying to do. Now, in an image, I remind you that convolution is just a sliding window operation, because of shift invariance, or better say, shift equivariance. The way we extract a patch of pixels at each location is exactly the same. The data itself, the pixels might be different, but the extraction of the page is exactly the same. On a curved surface, because of the curvature, it's not clear how to do it. So, for example, if you look at the page at two different locations, it might be very different. So that's uh, one of the challenges when we want to generalize uh, convolution or convolution-like operations to, to non-Euclidean domains. Basically, there are many ways of doing it. Uh, the first uh, uh, generalization of convolutions that we did on manifolds, we call it geodesic convolution. Basically, it boils down to uh, defining some notion of a patch on, on a mesh or otherwise represented surface. Uh, there are challenges such as the number of neighbors can be different. Uh, there are some ambiguities on, on surfaces. It's uh, uh, rotation ambiguity. On general graphs, it's local permutation ambiguity. But bottom line, you can implement it uh, in linear complexity, linear in the number of points in the surface. So it can be as efficient as classical convolutional neural networks. And we can solve different problems, some classical problems in computer graphics, such as correspondence, as I mentioned. Here you can see texture mapping that encodes correspondence between different shapes. So this, at least at the time, was state of the art. Uh, 
in uh, computer graphics benchmarks. So this is a more recent publication uh, where we show a uh, two-dimensional encoder architecture that starts with a 2D image, so it's a standard CNN. And uh, the generator is a mesh generator, so it's, uh, it's a geometric, uh, geometric gener generative architecture, which allows to predict also in real time the pose of the hand in 3D from a 2D input image in the wild. So it is trained on YouTube videos. And you can uh, imagine different applications, like for example, creating a 3D avatar in 3D. So it's a, a British company called Ariel AI that, that does uh, this kind of technology using uh, convolutional neural networks on meshes. Now, geometric deep learning has been applied in uh, many different applications. Uh, as I said, uh, com uh, graphs are very universal representations of systems of interactions of relations. So you can think of applications such as, uh, for example, uh, uh, collisions between particles in, in, in particle accelerators. Basically, the, the decay and the, the, the jets of particles that are produced can be modeled as graphs. Uh, different uh, interactions in biological networks, uh, interesting applications, for example, in drug repositioning, chemistry. So that's exactly what we'll be talking about. Uh, just as a side comment, uh, we also tried to apply these methods to social networks, in particular to the problem of fake news detection. Basically, we try to detect some abnormal patterns of propagation of uh, information or some content on, on Twitter. We had a company that was called Fabula AI that was acquired by Twitter uh, half a year ago, approximately. So uh, that's how I ended up working there. And uh, uh, we work on multiple problems, including recommender systems, where we try actually to create embeddings or representations of users and representations of content and try to match them. So uh, uh, basically also using graph, uh, graph neural networks. Now, talking about uh, chemistry and uh, applications that are probably closer to the, to the scope of interest uh, in this group, if you think of uh, designing a drug or designing a material, so in principle, this is a, a very hard problem because the space of different molecules that uh, you, you, you want to try is uh, very large. I think estimates vary, but probably at least 10 to the power 60, so it's more than the number of atoms in the universe. And of course, at the end, you want to find the molecule that has some defined uh, and desired set of properties, like, for example, efficiency against the pathogen if it's a drug, solubility in, I don't know, in water, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Or maybe if it's, uh, if it's material design, maybe some, uh, some uh, quantum mechanical properties or uh, physical properties. So at the end, you will uh, be doing experiments in the wet lab to, to test uh, the properties of the molecule. But of course, it is expensive and probably you can test that many candidates. Uh, on, uh, on top of it, basically, if you want to test more candidates to do some screening, you can solve quantum mechanical uh, equations and uh, try to predict these properties. You can also use maybe some light weight computations such as DFT, density functional theory. So with graph neural networks, uh, this was a paper from, uh, from DeepMind uh, uh, two years ago. They showed that they can use graph neural networks to predict properties of molecules with the accuracy of DFT being about four to five orders of magnitude faster. And actually there are already materials that are designed with these methods, a group of Fosporo Guzik, and currently at the University of Toronto, they designed with Samsung uh, organic light emitting diodes uh, using this virtual screening with graph neural networks. And the recent work actually, they uh, tried to predict uh, the smell of aromatic molecules. Which, uh, interesting, same way you can represent colors as a combination of basic colors, they also discover some principal components that can explain uh, different orders of uh, that, that we smell with our nose. Maybe even more interesting problem is generative models for molecules. You can think of a molecule as a graph, right, where the atoms are the nodes and the uh, edges are chemical bonds, and try to find the latent space in which, uh, uh, from which you can decode uh, a valid molecule. So it's more complicated than just the graph generation because not every graph defines a valid molecule, so there is a, a quite strict set of grammatical rules, if you want. That, that, that must be applied, but uh, there are several works that try to do it. I think currently state of the art uh, is a work from MIT on uh, junction tree uh, autoencoders. Bottom line, you can de develop uh, these encoder decoder architectures where you can generate new molecules from, uh, from this latent space. And of course, there are interesting questions whether 
uh, it allows to explore uh, parts of the space of molecules that are currently unknown, but it generalizes beyond the examples that, that it has seen. And uh, maybe the, the even uh, a more ambitious and challenging application is try not only to predict the molecule of a graph, but uh, an entire chemical reaction, what is called retrosynthesis. So you want to basically not only not only to, to generate the final outcome, but also how to produce it. And there, there are many secondary objectives you can try to maximize, for example, the, the, to maximize the yield or to minimize the, the, the toxic waste and so on and so forth. So this is a very new field. Uh, probably uh, in the next few years, we'll see some, some interesting results there. So the application of uh, drug discovery and repositioning, basically uh, this is work from Stanford, from the group of Yuri Leskowitz. What they use here is protein-to-protein -protein interaction network that, roughly speaking, models how our body works. And uh, drugs are described by the way they interact with proteins. So usually drugs are designed to bind to some, to some protein. So this is described by the drug-to-protein interaction graph. Uh, so what they are trying to predict is uh, drug interactions. So if you take multiple pills at the same time, there might be some side effects. Some of them might be uh, innocuous, some of them might be dangerous or even potentially lethal. So uh, that's what they, they, they try to predict with, uh, with this method. And it seems to be working uh, uh, pretty accurately. Uh, we tried to do a similar approach uh, for uh, molecules contained in food. You know that some foods contain uh, chemical classes of molecules, obviously in much small concentrations that are similar to, to the chemical classes uh, that are used, for example, in, uh, in, oncological, uh, in oncological therapy. Uh, so basically we train the classifier that predict uh, uh, anti-cancer drug uh, likeness. And we applied it to molecules in food. Again, uh, the representation here was some signal on, uh, on the protein-to-protein -protein interaction network. And well, not, not very surprising, you, you, you can find that, that some foods that are known to be healthy, like green tea, for example, contain many such molecules. So let me... Now go back uh, to the, let's say, to the announced topic of this talk, to, to how to use uh, genetic deep learning for protein uh, design. So uh, as you know, probably better than me, proteins are important. They appear everywhere. They are encoded in our DNA. And uh, uh, basically, at least large parts of the, of the genetic code are responsible for, uh, uh, for, the, the, for the description of the proteins. And basically, there are chains of uh, amino acids that are connected together. And because of uh, physical forces, they uh, bend into three-dimensional structures. And these uh, three-dimensional structures are responsible uh, for their function. So you can find proteins, for example, uh, in different systems of our body, such as uh, the immune system, and antibodies, storage of oxygen, such as hemoglobin, uh, transport of uh, different uh, different compounds through the cellular membranes, uh, different communications such as uh, hormones, structure, for example, collagen is a protein that gives the skin its structure, and uh, obviously a different chemical reaction, uh, basically uh, catalysts. So uh, uh, one of the classical and, and notoriously difficult problems in, in bioinformatics is given uh, a protein sequence is how to predict the uh, three-dimensional structure of the protein, protein folding. So actually, there has been recently interesting progress in this domain, particularly the alpha fold work from, from DeepMind. We are trying actually to do uh, the other way around. So we know the protein structure, or at least approximately. We want to design proteins with certain structures. We want to, to tell how should we, uh, basically how we should engineer a sequence or parts of this sequence such that the protein will have certain properties. In particular, we would like the protein to bind to, to, some, to some target, to another protein. So you can think of binding as a kind of lock and key uh, uh, metaphor. But of course, it's much more complicated because it's more than just a geometric uh, complementarity. We also have uh, uh, physical forces. So there is some uh, attraction and repulsion. Uh, so it's both geometric and electrostatic properties. And uh, one of the interesting applications, uh, at least potentially, is in the, uh, in the treatment of cancer, immunotherapy. Basically, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, in immunotherapy, you try to block one of the two proteins in the PD-1, PD-L1 complex, uh, such that uh, cancer cells can be destroyed by the normal 
functioning of the, of the immune system. Let me skip these other applications. Well, this is another cool application. You can potentially design a, a protein that binds to some, to some molecules, such as, for example, traces of explosives, and uh, you can potentially detect chemical sensors that are very sensitive and very accurate. So this is what we are trying to, to do. We are trying to design uh, uh, proteins that are high affinity binders for some, some other protein targets. And when we are talking about proteins, basically there are many different ways of thinking of them. So you can think of them as uh, collections of atoms, basically a point cloud. Uh, you can think, think of them as a graph. You can think of them as uh, some uh, abstract secondary structures, such as helixes or alpha sheets and so on. Uh, here we are thinking of them as molecular surfaces, because uh, what, we, uh, what we conjecture is that Whatever happens inside, basically, the protein is folded in some complicated way. For interactions, uh, what happens inside doesn't matter. What another molecule sees from the outside is the molecular surface. Okay, well, of course, there is uh, uh, an issue of how you compute this molecular surface, so there are many ways uh, of doing it. But uh, let's say that given uh, a representation of the protein, we are able to extract this molecular surface. And we are trying to apply uh, geometric deep learning on surfaces, as I described before. So basically, it boils down to building some local system of uh, coordinates. We use uh, geodesic polar coordinates, so around each uh, vertex on, on, on the surface that is represented as a, as a mesh, as a triangular mesh surface. We build a set of weighting functions that roughly act as soft pixels. So each of such weighting functions is equivalent to a pixel in, in a standard image, basically in a patch of an image. So these weights, unlike uh, the classical CNNs, are uh, learnable. So we can, uh, basically we have a family of Gaussian, uh, Gaussian uh, functions that, that act as local weights, and we can, uh, uh, during training, we can modify the, the uh, mean uh, vectors and covariance matrices. And you can interpret this uh, spatial convolution filter as a mixture of Gaussians. Okay, so now we apply it to proteins. Basically, we represent the protein as a surface. We extract patches around each location. And in our, uh, in our examples, the patches are roughly around 10 angstrom. So it's a pretty big portion of the molecule. On uh, these surfaces, we compute uh, geometric features and chemical features. So uh, the, the geometric features are curvatures. Basically, they tell how non-flat the surface is. And Chemical features are uh, some standard things, such as the, the Poisson Boltzmann uh, 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 features. So overall, we have five-dimensional features. Uh, so it's something that is pre-computed uh, for historical reasons. Now we are able to compute all the features, actually, to learn them automatically from the, from the, uh, just from the coordinates of the of the points. But let's say that this is some pre-computation step. That, uh, uh, that is done and we get the surface that each point has these, uh, these features. So then we basically we construct these uh, page operators. So using local system of coordinates, we have an equivalent of convolutional neural network on, on the surface that acts on these features and produces some representations locally at each point that can then be fed into some uh, task specific layers of a convolutional neural network. So essentially we have uh, a basic building block, like the conversion operation in, uh, in, uh, in standard CNNs, with the difference now that these can, can work on, uh, on curved surfaces, on, on, on molecular surfaces of, of proteins. And uh, the three types of applications that we consider are uh, prediction of the interface site, so basically which part of the, of the molecule will be binding to a target, the classification of the pocket, basically to which molecule will it be binding, and then fast protein-to-protein -protein interaction search. When we have a, a collection of uh, protein surfaces and we'd like to, to predict which of them will bind to, to some target. Okay, so just an example of how this might work in, uh, in a pipeline. So this is how we actually uh, try to produce experimental results. Uh, we have some, uh, uh, some target protein. Let's say this is PD, uh, PD-L1 protein for for cancer target, we first predict the uh, the binding site that is here indicated in red. Then we uh, have a database of proteins, basically some small structures. We 
the, uh, some seed uh, pieces of, of proteins. We try to see which of them will, uh, will bind to this site. And then we uh, predict an entire complex. So in this way, we build uh, a protein that, that will, bind, uh, will bind to this, uh, to this target. Okay, so let's start with interface site prediction. So essentially, it's a point-wise binary classification problem. And the training set is examples of proteins uh, uh, with, uh, which are known to have some, some interfaces that, that bind to some other proteins. And uh, basically, this way, we can, uh, we can uh, label points that, are, that belong to interface or don't belong to an interface. And the performance criterion will be uh, uh, area under the, the, uh, the, uh, the ROC curve. We use multiple data, uh, data sets for, uh, for proteins where we have uh, uh, basically pairs of proteins that bind together. Uh, around 3,000 uh, crystallite proteins. We used 90% of, uh, of these data sets for training and 10% for testing. And here you can see examples. So this is a typical example. We have uh, area under the curve of about 84%. So here you can see in red the uh, probability of, uh, of a point being an interface. And in green you can see the ground rules. So you can see that it's, it is pretty close to the ground rules. We also predict some other sites that potentially can be interfaces. We actually see that indeed uh, uh, we have some binding in, in, these, in these sites as well. So the color shows the, uh, the probability of a point being interface or not. So blue is non-interface, red is interface. Okay, and here if you think of basically of the uh, distribution of distances between uh, uh, true interface points and non-interface points, we obviously want the non-interface points to be uh, to have very uh, uh, to have very low uh, score, and the uh, and the true interface to have very high score. And ideally, we want to have completely separate uh, distribution. Obviously, it's not the case. So the overlap uh, here represents uh, the points where we have some confusion. So again, area under the curve is about uh, 85%. So here is an uh, interesting ablation study where we, uh, we looked at uh, which features are important for predicting interface. And I remind you that we have two ki kinds of features. Uh, geometric features, uh, they describe the, the structure of the surface, and the, the chemical features. And you, you see that actually geometric features are less important than chemical features. Using just, uh, for example, electrostatic features, we get about 80%, but the combination of geometric and chemical features performs the best. That's the, uh, the red bar here with 85%. So here are some uh, other interesting examples from, uh, from actual uh, proteins. So this uh, particular uh, example is interesting because usually these binding sites look like pockets. So on this one, you don't really have a pocket. It looks almost flat. And nevertheless, we predict very nicely, uh, very nicely the, uh, uh, the binding site. So this is also an interesting example because uh, it is a, a modified, it's an engineer protein uh, that, that is supposed to, uh, to bind to, 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 some, to, to, to some target. So the wild type that appears in nature doesn't have any, any binding. And indeed, we predict that there is no binding. And this is the design protein that was modified, where, uh, which binds to the target. And here we predict that, that, that it has an interface. Here is another uh, example. I think this is an influenza inhibitor. Again, if you compare the wild type to the design, you see that we have a very clear uh, interface. Again, the, the green here indicates the ground rules where it actually binds to the, to the target. Some other examples, so I think this is a, a protein complex that, that self, some self-assembling cage protein. So this is probably slightly less successful in predicting the, the, the binding site. And here you can see also the influence of the depth of the architecture. So we didn't really try more than three convolutional layers, but you can see that the performance improves if we go from, let's say, one uh, convolutional layer to three convolutional layers. We have some technical challenges in, in uh, going deeper, at least with the, the legacy architecture that we used. But now we can, uh, we can do much deeper networks and, and hopefully the results can be even better. And here you can see an example of uh, how uh, different uh, the prediction results become when you use deeper architecture. So it's much cleaner and much more, mm -hmm. much more localized. And here is comparison to some state of the art. So Spider is... Uh, 
another method that is uh, used for prediction of, uh, of binding sites. And you can see that uh, we, are, we perform significantly better than, than this baseline. And if you look at the, uh, at the distributions of, of scores, you see that Spider is performing quite poorly. And here is a comparison, again, on some, some examples. So here, for example, it, Spider doesn't predict anything interesting. While we predict, and you can see that here is the ground truth binding site that, that we get in this complex. And here are some more examples. Okay, so let's about, talk about uh, uh, the second application, the uh, pocket classification. So in this example, we had uh, uh, seven molecules, basically cofactors that uh, bind uh, to, to, to protein. And we want to tell not only that there is binding, so there is an interface, we also want to predict to which molecule it binds. And you, you see that some of these molecules are very similar. So for example, these NADP and NAD, uh, they, they, they look almost the same. So in this case, it's a seven class uh, point-wise labeling problem. And again, the training set consists of examples of proteins interacting with different small molecules. We had about 1,500 uh, structures. We used 72% for training, 8 for validation, and 20 for testing. And here, uh, it was important actually to very carefully design the training and the testing say, set based on the sequence homology. So we don't want to test on proteins that are uh, uh, too similar. Then, then it would be, we can get very high uh, accuracy, but it will, not be, it will not be very informative. So this is the confusion matrix. You see that we get quite good performance. Well, there is some confusion between more, uh, more difficult cases. And again, here we have uh, the ablation study that uh, again shows that the combination of geometric and chemical feature, features performs, uh, performs the best. So this is one of the examples where we can actually correctly predict uh, uh, distinguish between uh, two different pockets that, that actually have a lot of uh, structural similarity. Uh, this is measured by this uh, TM score. So these proteins are structurally very similar, but nevertheless, one pocket binds to uh, NADP and another one binds to NAD, which are different molecules. And uh, we are able to, to distinguish it correctly. And here is, uh, again, a zoom in into these, into these uh, different pockets. So let me say uh, now a few words about the, the, the fast PPI search. So this is something that we are currently working on. So the results that I'm showing here are already not up to date. And also the method that, that we are currently trying uh, works much better and uh, is much cleaner. But uh, nevertheless, what we, what we try to do here is we want to compute local features that are indicative of, of, of binding. And uh, for this purpose, we use a Siamese architecture. So basically, it's, it's uh, two copies of the same neural network that share the same weights. And it's fed with a triplet of, of points. So we get, uh, basically, we get examples of interacting and non-interacting uh, uh, interacting points. So basically, the way that it works, we have uh, examples of proteins that are crystallized together. So we know that they bind. So we take points that are nearby, and we say these are positives, and points that are far away uh, that do not interact, and these are negatives. So in the construction of data set here, it's also very important to include uh, uh, hard negatives. So it's not just enough to say that I just take two random points and they will be negatives. It is obvious. We want to, uh, also to include points that are sufficiently similar and close to the, to the interface, but nevertheless, they are not, not on the interface. And here we use uh, either the standard triplet loss or a D prime loss. So this is our version that considers not, uh, not pairwise, uh, uh, similarity, basically, uh, uh, standard triplet loss, loss tries to map positives uh, nearby and negatives far away. Uh, D prime loss, we look at the distribution of uh, positive and negative distances, and we try to push them uh, as far as possible. So it's a ratio of the, the of the uh, of their standard deviations. Here we had about six thousand uh, pairs with eighty percent used for training and twenty percent used for testing. And uh, this is an, an illustration of this uh, Siamese architecture. So here you can see uh, this is the target page. This is a page that binds to it. And this is some random negative page that doesn't bind. The, then this is uh, fed into the, the geometric neural network. We get uh, the features. 
and uh, we, try, we try to minimize the distance between the features of the positives and maximize the distance between the features of the, of the negatives. And here you can see the, the distribution of distances between positives and negatives, basically interacting pairs of pages and non-interacting pairs of pages. So you see that there is a very clear distinction between those that interact and, don't, and not. And again here, an ablation study shows that the combination of geometric and chemical features is the best. We get about 99% uh, area under the curve, which is a very good performance. Way better than anything else that, that exists in the literature. The final step, if we want to, to build the protein, so we, we can use uh, these features to, to predict which pieces of protein will, will bind. Basically, it works on, on, on a page-wise basis. Once we have these uh, corresponding seeds, we use a geometric refinement. Basically, it's a RANSAC uh, algorithm, uh, uh, randomized consensus that is uh, commonly used in computer vision, for example, to actually produce the alignment of the two structures. And here is an example of, for example, predicting binder for PDL1. So this is the target protein. Again, here we see the, the predicted interface. And uh, we basically the, the, the closest protein that, that we predict is a, a mouse PD, uh, PD1 protein, which is very similar to the human protein. For comparison, the, the, the human protein is shown in, the, in gray here. And uh, in this case, we actually predict the correct human protein, so the two. Uh, the two structures completely coincide. Now, uh, if you think of uh, this analogy of uh, uh, a key fitting into a lock, in uh, multiple PPI interaction search, we are looking at multiple locks and multiple keys, and we want to see which, uh, which fit into, into which. And uh, here we have about, um, I forget now the number, I think it was about 10,000 of, uh, uh, of different proteins. And uh, we look at, the, uh, at how many structures were, uh, were matched correctly uh, in, uh, top 100, uh, in top 100 candidates. So basically, we rank them and see then how many of them are correct. So the, the, the reference here is PatchDoc, which is uh, one of the standard methods, and, uh, and GIF is another geometric descriptor. Uh, we also look at the, run, uh, at the running time. So this descriptor, it's similar to what we do, but it doesn't use any learning. You see that performance is much poorer. It, it is able to find only nine correct structures out of 100, while we are able to find uh, 62. And the runtime is similar. PageDoc is much more accurate, but it is about three orders of magnitude slower. It actually does geometric alignment. So uh, this is the example on uh, bound proteins. So here, the important distinction is that when the proteins are crystallized together, they are bound. When we look at, pro uh, at protein targets, they are unbound. Basically, they exist uh, on, on their own without the binder attached to it. So this results in some deformation of the molecule. So the problem of looking uh, uh, at unbound is more, uh, is more complicated. So the performance here uh, drops, but still we perform better than page doc while being, uh, again, uh, multiple orders of magnitude uh, faster. So we also have some experimental results. So uh, I guess you know that, that uh, uh, basically you can, uh, you can produce uh, proteins by uh, actually modifying a genetic sequence. Then, uh, well, this is what my, uh, my collaborators in Lausanne do. They uh, take a, a microorganism, in this case it's yeast, and they uh, uh, let it ingest this uh, piece, uh, piece of DNA that encodes the, the desired protein plus some extra stuff. Basically, there is also a protein attached to it that uh, pushes it through the cellular membrane and also creates a, a, a signal that can be read with uh, optical sensor. Uh, there are two signals, uh, uh, that one that tells that the protein is expressed and another signal that tells that the protein binds to the target. And basically, you get this, uh, you can measure this signal and you get these kind of plots, basically. Uh, this is one uh, signal, and this is the second signal. So you want to see uh, something, something in this region where you have, uh, when the protein is expressed and it, is, uh, it, it, it binds to the target. And, uh, well, let me skip it. So you can also uh, modify uh, the interface, basically the way that it's done. It's uh, uh, basically it's, uh, 
it is, it is a kind of evolution. You can take some uh, parts of this uh, sequence and you want to, to modify the side chains of the, of the amino acids. So if you think of a lock and the key, basically there are some parts that might, might interfere uh, outside, the, the, the outside the seed. So for example, this, uh, the, this yellow part here uh, interferes with the, with the binding. So we, ideally we want to replace it with something else. That is shown here in orange. So basically, this evolution improves uh, improves the binding. Well, so these are a little bit old slides. So we have uh, much cleaner and much uh, better experimental results, including actually the crystal structure. So for the first time, we can we can see that that uh, the, these computed proteins really work. So let me conclude. Uh, it is, I think, an interesting uh, tool set for protein science. We show several applications, but it can be applied to, to many other problems. Basically, any molecular surface for which you have some, some data, some ground truth uh, uh, data can be used with this framework. Uh, one of the big difference compared to, uh, let's say, handcrafted features that have been used before, you can uh, define uh, features that are task specific. So same way as it worked in computer vision, it is very hard to design a descriptor that is good for all applications. And that's why uh, deep learning was so successful in replacing handcrafted descriptors that, 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 that were used before. It is significantly more accurate and also significantly faster than previous methods, at least uh, in some applications. And it is also independent of sequence because in many uh, uh, works on, on, uh, on proteins, uh, people Look in, also look at how proteins evolve uh, through evolution. So they, they, they also take, for example, similar proteins from, from other species. Here we are completely independent of it. There are many challenges, for example, this uh, problem of bound versus unbound, where we, we see significant degradation in performance. It, is probably, it can probably be solved by data augmentation. We can uh, maybe simulate what happens to a protein when it binds. And of course, the challenge now is experimental validation. So at least have crystal structure. So we see already that, that it starts working. But to me, as a computer scientist, it is very frustrating that it might take just a couple of weeks to design the protein, but then it can take several months or maybe a year to, to actually to, 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 to obtain the, the, the protein and, the, and obtain its structure. So it's, I'm not used to, to these time scales, but I think it's, it's inevitable in, in experimental science. So I think I will finish here. So this, these are many of my collaborators on these and uh, other projects that, that somehow have contributed to all this line of research on genetic deep learning. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, I have several questions actually. Uh, the first one is, uh, what are the size constraints for protein generated that way? So how, how, how large of a protein can you do? Well, good question. So uh, it really depends on, the, on how you represent the molecular surface because uh, the number of points we can deal with with these algorithms uh, varies, let's say, in the range of probably tens of thousands if you uh, don't want to run into memory problems, let's say. So uh, it also depends on how accurately you discretize your, uh, your surface. So uh, it's, uh, let's say it's a parameter of, of the algorithm, how small the triangles are. Uh, so it's hard for me to tell you in terms of the sequence length, because uh, the sequence length really doesn't matter. Everything that is hidden inside, we, we don't care. So it's more about the, the, the size of the, or the area of the, outside surface and how many points uh, its discretization contains. Uh, okay, uh, another, uh, another question is, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not really a question, it's more, more, more uh, a note. Uh, I think is when you talk about uh, wildlife uh, proteins, uh, I think is that they are not actually wildlife. Uh, because uh, a lot of uh, proteins that are uh, purified from the cells, uh, cannot be crystallized. Yeah. Uh, they cannot be crystallized, and uh, so those proteins are uh, built uh, uh, from uh, similar proteins that have conser conserved regions, and that can can actually be crystallized, uh, but they're not uh, 
uh, really wild, uh, wild type so uh, that can also pose a problem uh, with this uh, framework. Yeah. So well, uh, so first of all a disclaimer, I'm not an expert in proteins so take with a grain of salt uh, uh, everything, everything I say but uh, uh, we assume that we know the structure in some way, whether it's uh, whether it's obtained from X-ray crystallography, whether it's obtained from from some well nowadays maybe you can use even uh, more modern methods such as cryo-EM maybe instead of instead of crystallizing. So maybe this way you can uh, obtain structure of proteins that that uh, cannot crystallize for whatever reasons. So we see it also with our proteins that that some of them uh, fail to crystallize or they fail to crystallize together. It means that probably the interaction between them is not is transient, so they don't really stick together. They maybe uh, stick and then 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 then, then, then separate. Uh, they, they also may require catalyst. Sorry. They also may require catalyst. Yeah, it it, it is possible. So so uh, I don't know. At the moment you have structure from whatever source, uh, we can do these computations. But it requires the knowledge of of structure. It depends on the problem. It requires also some labels. So in our case, we we take the label. Uh, it's supervised learning. It's an uh, in interesting question how you can uh, do uh, this learning in an unsupervised way. We have some ideas that, that are also inspired from the, uh, from the domain of computer, uh, computer vision. Uh, but you need some, some, kind of, uh, uh, some kind of ground rules, for example, telling that two things uh, bind together. Okay, uh, third question. <laughs> uh, have you considered uh, some sort of augmentation? For the data? What kind of augmentation? So that's what's on what I'm asking. Have you considered anything? So we are considering augmentation for the uh, uh, for the, the, the uh, to deal with this problem of uh, bound and unbound structures. Mm -hmm. So basically, some uh, geometric deformations of the of the molecule, or even uh, uh, simulations. So proteins are not really static; they move a little bit. Uh, uh, so uh, this kind of data augmentation, yes, we are we are, we are trying to do it. So well, I should probably ask my data. my collaborators. So uh, all are uh, open source uh, data sets. It's a data yeah. set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the crystallography structure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have more technical uh, question. So uh, you mentioned that you had problem with deep architectures, like three layers is a supposed to be a maximum for you. So is it connected with the problem that you had to develop this convolution by yourself? I mean. Could a program, for example, for NVIDIA GPU, it is quite sophisticated and it is not quite performant if you don't have enough expertise? No, so it's, uh, well, there are several uh, several issues here. Uh, so first of all, uh, well, for legacy reasons, because we just used more or less off the shelf the code that we developed initially, now we know to do it much better, uh, that we pre-compute the pitches. So the, the local coordinates are pre-computed, so we need to store them somewhere in memory. And uh, this limits actually uh, how deep the architecture can go. So now we can compute them on the fly. So uh, now this limitation is uh, is inexistent. We see it all when uh, it uh, basically many architectures geometric deep learning they are a little bit similar to, to, to standard CNNs. You get a vanishing gradients problems. So we actually have good way of uh, doing uh, skip connections in uh, in geometrically principled way where we have an affine transformation. Basically, we we keep the feature from the from the center point itself uh, in uh, in the right way. So we can actually do these uh, residual architectures where we can go very deep, potentially tens or even hundreds of layers. In the, in the yep. So it's more similar to uh, what is called highway networks than to, to ResNet because it also includes the transformation in the in the in the connection itself. Have you tried uh, uh, like uh, uh, more uh, neuroplastic architectures, for example, uh, differential neuroplasticity or capsule networks? No. So it's, it was pretty straightforward uh, application of, uh, uh, of the architectures that we developed in 2016. So that's why I'm saying that uh, uh, this is legacy. Now we, we do much better. 
for uh, other applications in vision and graphics. And uh, basically, we see that we already run into this bottleneck that the, the architecture that we used initially is not uh, uh, as good as, uh, as we would like it to be. So basically, we need to revamp everything uh, and redo it from scratch. So do you have any information about the surface, about how, how does it look like? I mean, uh, in your presentation, previous presentation, there's some kind of vague uh, uh, situation which this model cannot predict the surface, which means there's some kind of similar surface in this so I'm not sure I understand what do you mean by predict the surface? Uh, so there are so many surfaces in your data, right? Yeah. But they are, they are all unique or there are some kinds of similarities? Well, so that's, uh, okay, so that, that's a good question. You're probably talking about structural similarity, right? So, uh, so basically... Uh, because you're basically uh, using geometric feature for your classification that means this, I mean, this and these features seem to be a lot in the so, so uh, maybe, uh, well, uh, I hope that I understood the question correctly, but uh, basically uh, that's why we are very careful in, uh, in designing the data set where we, uh, uh, where, uh, we uh, look at, uh, the, at the structural similarity between the proteins. It's not a big deal if you, if you have all the proteins that are roughly the same, right? So they're, they're very structurally similar, and then uh, if you predict the binding uh, for one of them, all the rest... Uh, uh, the prediction will also probably be correct. So, so basically, uh, our data set is structured in a way where, where uh, the, the proteins are very different. So unique is probably, uh, 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 it's hard to define it, it's hard to quantify it. So it's a good question. So we try to do, well, uh, we, we, I don't have a figure here, but, but we tried uh, to, uh, to do basically unsupervised uh, clustering. So we, we tried to re represent this uh, feature space to see if we are able to detect structures. And we see some structures that are well known. We also see structures that are less known. So, of course, uh, it will probably require experimental validation. For example, if we take the PDL1 protein, it has some uh, well known binding sites where basically every drug design, uh, uh, every binder design, they, they try to bind it at that site. But we are also able to predict some other binding sites that might be uh, previously unknown. So I think that one of the really interesting challenges uh, here is whether uh, we can go beyond of what we've seen in the training set. Because it's obviously interesting, but can we generalize to, to, to structures that uh, previously never seen before? So it's. Uh, so about generalization, uh, do you use deep uh, Bayesian methods? No. Okay. So all, all good questions. It's, uh, 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 the, the issue with these things is that it takes a lot of time to, to, uh, to produce. So uh, we thought at some point to, to uh, basically to, to take an architecture that, uh, uh, that was available at that time and, uh, and work with it. So uh, it, it's hard to change it. Uh, to change it. Uh, all the time because uh, uh, then, then uh, there are many months of, 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 of producing these, uh, these proteins, but uh, we are now working on, on, uh, on the next version of the architecture that hopefully will be producing much better results. Even with this, I would say, very primitive thing that, 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 that I hate now because it's old and I know that, that we can do much better, uh, we are already uh, able produ produ to produce uh, very good results. So. No, so it's a geometric CNN. So it's uh, uh, basically the uh, the sliding window. The convolution operation is replaced with a geodesic convolution. Uh, could you explain one more time how you embed this geometric space into the? So well, let me show it. Also, there is a mentioning of uh, some publication, 2019. Is it published? Results? Yeah. So the, this. Uh, these results, well, uh, they are published in uh, BioArchive in, uh, in April. That, that's what is going to appear in May. Yeah. But I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> so uh, this is how it works. So that's, uh, uh, that's the surface. So it's represented as a triangular mesh. So uh, think an image. If you have a round each pixel, you can open a page of 
pixels, right? So usually this is how the filters look in convolutional neural networks. So here we need to some kind of generalization of, uh, uh, of these patches and uh, it is achieved by using this system of weights. So actually in our architecture they're, uh, uh, they're fixed. They're, I think they're even not, uh, they're not modifiable. So basically these are some Gaussian blobs and they uh, essentially pick up uh, the values of the features from uh, around uh, each such location. So in, in the patch it will be a regular grid, in a standard image patch it will be a regular grid and it will be delta functions that picks the first pixel, the second pixel. Here because, uh, the, because of the curvature and because, uh, because it's a mesh, it's not a, it's not a regular grid, uh, you <coughs> basically have no other choice but, but have some system of coordinates with respect to which you can, you can define these weights. You, you cannot order canonically the points around your, uh, your center vertex because it differs, even the number of points is different. Is that concluding augmentation, which you said was? So augmentation, just you generate more surfaces. Yes, but I think that uh, moving of protein is not, uh, right, has not influence on the So here we don't consider it's dynamics nice. at all. And uh, my suspicion, or let's say suspicion of people who understand more about, uh, about protein than me, is that some, sometimes, for example, you are unable to crystallize the proteins exactly because of these effects, that, that they don't really bind and, and, and stay like this, but they, uh, basically they bind and then they separate. So you still read, uh, read out the binding signal, but when you try to crystallize them, either none of them uh, is crystallized or only one of them is crystallized. So how to augment the data is a good question. I think it depends on, uh, we have sufficient uh, amount of data, even though it, it might think, uh, you, you might think that it's small number, right? We have maybe a few thousands of, of protein pairs, but uh, for, uh, for prediction of the binding, uh, uh, basically we work uh, uh, at the level of patches. So you have uh, the, the, the number of positive and negative pairs can be very large, especially negatives. So these are, uh, let's say the number of patches is as the number of points in your surface. Let's say 100 uh, or 10,000 per, per molecule. So you have, let's say, 1,000 mo different molecules, uh, about 10,000 patches, then all the pairwise combinations. So it's, it's a lot, it's in the millions. What is 85%? Well, uh, performance is 85%. Well, it depends on the application. So uh, for, the, uh, for the binding uh, prediction, it's actually 99% area under the curve, yeah. Again, that's, uh, well, it's, it's just a number. You need to compare it to something else to understand whether 99 can be very good or very bad. Depends on, uh, depends on what you want. It's also hard to do it because it's magic. I think protein design, at least from uh, what I understand, they, they do a lot of trial and error, but for example, this thing, uh, so I have this example, they're very proud of it. So this one, there is no evident pocket. So uh, uh, humans usually cannot say that it will bind here. So uh, people who work with, with uh, protein design a lot, they already have the intuition and they can tell that this looks like a pocket, but it's really hard. Sometimes you, you, you think that it will be, and it's not. So it's, I think no human can, can, uh, can work at this level, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, the, 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 the best example of such uh, superpowers I've seen is the ability to detect uh, alpha shifts on a protein uh, sequence. Oh, yeah, I also heard about such people that, that yeah. can look at the sequence and say, say here we'll have a yes, helical structure. The alpha shift, but uh, yeah. not, not the binding side. It's, it's so different, right? So it's, uh, well, uh, there, you might have many, uh, uh, many geometric structures, but uh, only one of them will bind, right? So it's basically to say that this is an alpha shift is not probably not a yes, big deal. Yes, it's not yeah. I think this is a pioneering application to this task of protein binding. I mean, it's 
diametrical Well, as far as I know, we are the first. Yeah. <laughs> Not many people uh, yet uh, no, use, use, use it. Yeah. Yeah. People usually do that. So people, well, there are many ways of doing it. Uh, with machine learning, people also try to use uh, volumetric CNNs. But the issue with volumetric CNNs is that there is no invariance to anything, so even not to rotations. Then it's hugely wasteful. So all the in internal uh, representation of the molecule uh, is, is useless because it doesn't interact. So uh, uh, we see, well, that, that's actually why we opted for, for, for this kind of representation. Surfaces for, uh, for uh, predicting interaction are very natural representation. For other applications, for folding, for example, maybe it's better to work with a graph. And also the interesting result that it's not only geometry that matches, it's also the other physical chemical around Actually, uh, how well can you predict uh, physical chemical properties from a surface? So we don't predict them from the surface because we know the atoms. So, uh, well, again, uh, I should probably ask my collaborators, but it's uh, uh, some, uh, some chemical software that computes it. It's, it's fast. I think it's just solving some PDE. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, this is actually what we are trying to do now on the fly as well. So we don't want. What do you use else except for electrostatic potential? What else? So, yeah. So you can see it here. So these are the uh, these are the features that we use. Ah, three electron, just three, three features. Yep. Yeah. So it's very little information. Actually, the geometric features for sure we can compute from the uh, from the positions of the atoms. We don't uh, uh, we don't really need to pre-compute any curvatures. It's uh, it was cheap and dirty. We can do much better. Yeah, so that's the ugly part, so that's RANSAC. So we have uh, multiple uh, correspondences, and then uh, basically this uh, randomized consensus algorithm, uh, it prunes out outliers. Nowadays, basically what we try to do is to find a, a rigid transformation that matches one molecule to another. Uh, nowadays you can do, so this is in, in, in geometry processing, this is called ICP, iterative closest point algorithm. So basically that, that uh, rigidly aligns to structures. Nowadays, with uh, with deep learning, you can uh, predict the the these alignment uh, parameters, the, the rigid transformation that, that matches the two things. So it's a neural network that takes two surfaces or two point clouds and produces a rotation matrix and translation uh, translation vector. You don't need to do any ransack. So that's what we are trying, and it's differentiable, so you can integrate it into a deep learning pipeline. So that's what we are trying to to do currently, basically to, to have it. Uh, end-to-end -end TensorFlow without any pre-computations. So graph applications. Okay, so let me briefly talk about graphs. Um, so if you look at this, uh, uh, this architecture, right, uh, basically the difference between graphs and meshes is that uh, in meshes you have uh, some low dimensional structure. So you can, roughly speaking, you can attach a plane at each point. So the tangent plane of, uh, of, the, of the underlying manifold. In graphs you don't have this. So in, uh, here the only ambiguity you have is rotation, right? So if uh, I don't know how to canonically order the, the, the vertices around the point, right? Those that are directly connected, so let me point with the laser. Uh, but if I fix one of them, I can order the rest, let's say, in, in, in clockwise orientation. But any point can be the first one, right? So basically, it's defined up to rotation. And it's a technical question how to deal with it. There are several ways. In a graph, basically, there is no uh, canonical ordering. So it's not only rotation, it's not enough to fix one of the points. Uh, I can reorder them any way I want. So. Uh, this automatically implies that on graphs I must use aggregation operators that are permutation invariant. Things like sum, maximum, or uh, here it can be something more complicated. So the uh, features, uh, or the, the, the filters that, that I can extract on graphs are isotropic. The, uh, you don't have uh, a notion of uh, direction on the graph. On a manifold you do. So on a manifold you might have a filter that, that uh, responds in certain directions along certain structures. 
so a side note, you can also do anisotropic uh, features on graphs, but you need to introduce some side information. For, for example, uh, some subgraph structures such as motifs. Um, so there are several ways of uh, working with graphs. You can uh, uh, actually interpret, you can think of uh, diffusion operators or Laplacian operators on graphs, and then uh, their eigen decomposition is equivalent to Fourier transform. So the, the eigenvectors or, uh, of the Laplacian, of the graph Laplacian, are um, the analogy of the Fourier basis. So you can decompose uh, functions on, on, uh, on graph vertices in these bases and then apply filter in the frequency domain. Uh, obviously, computationally, it's expensive. It doesn't generalize well. So the trick is to avoid, basically, to work with class of filters that can be described in terms of uh, simple matrix vector operations. If you think of polynomials, for example, it's just taking powers of the Laplacian. So you don't explicitly need to perform eigen decomposition. So this is a popular uh, architecture that is called uh, Chebyshev net for, uh, um, for uh, uh, deep learning on graphs. And it, it is actually a spatial filter because uh, the Laplacian is a local operator that affects only the neighbors. If you take its powers, then it affects the neighbors of the neighbors. So overall, you can think of two basic operations that you can do on graphs. You can transform, you can make uh, a transformation that is uh, uh, node-wise, so you transform in the same way each feature on the node, or you can diffuse, so you can aggregate information. So, well, if you write it, uh, I don't know if you can see. So if your features can be arranged into a matrix X, so this matrix is of size N by, let's say, D, N is the number of nodes in the graph, and D is the dimension of each feature, then you can have some node-wise transformation, so this is matrix W that transforms each uh, node in the same way, and then you have a diffusion operator. So this is, for example, the Laplacian or just the adjacency matrix that uh, basically uh, aggregates information from the neighbor nodes. And you can apply multiple such filters uh, uh, many times. So you can think of this roughly as a convolution. Uh, what about random walks on graph? Well, so this is a random walk. Okay. Right? So that's, uh, that, that one of instances of this uh, diffusion matrix can be can be a random walk. You can, of course, make it more complicated. So, for example, graph attention networks, they still use a linear diffusion, but the diffusion operator itself depends on the features. So it's not a fixed weight uh, like the graph Laplacian, but uh, the weight also depends on the features, how similar they are. Or, in general, if you think of uh, well, what Google people call uh, message passing neural networks, we call it edge convolution. You can think of it just as uh, some nonlinear operator that applies to, to your features, produces some new features. So this can incorporate uh, uh, vertex features, edge features, and so on. Yeah, so that's uh, three minutes on graphs. <laughs> Thank you. Um,